We have one of the nicest pastors that ever walked the face of the earth. How could he not be, being the son of Jerry and Chris Smith, Pastor Brian Smith? And I will tell you, he thought, he said, I don't know if I did very good. I thought his sermon this morning, Jeff, it was phenomenal. And I hope that you'll listen and every one of us will receive it from his heart. I love this guy. He is a rock star in my book. Give him a big welcome. Well, I... I uh, gave all my money in the offering, Pastor, so I'll give you money later for saying that. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> hey, it's good to see you guys here. How many of you made it to the state fair? Been there, got the tattoo to prove it, right? You know you've been to the state fair when you see people with just tattoos all over the place, and it's, it's fun to see. Um, un- unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe Josh and Anna went to the fair with Pastor Weaver. He was our tour guide for the, for the day, so... Um, Maybe, maybe we should ask them about that later. But uh, it is good to see you guys here. My name is Pastor Brian. I've been a part of this church since 1990 when my family and I started coming. Uh, and so it's, it's a privilege to be here this morning. Uh, before I get started, um, if you have a smartphone or a tablet with you or your iPod, if you would take it out for a moment. And uh, if you have, turn on your camera and turn it on the rear facing camera so you can see yourself. And I want you to investigate, all right? So go ahead, take it out. We're gonna, this is crowd participation for a moment. I won't call anybody out necessarily, but you need to investigate. Make sure that the breadcrumbs are out of your beard. You need to make sure that the crust is out of your eyes and that um, you know, everything's still in place. Everybody look good? No straight eyebrow hairs or anything like that. Um, if someone would take a moment and hand theirs to Pastor Weaver, because clearly something's going on and he needs it too, but um, you got it. Did you do it though? Did it work? Okay. This, we didn't think it worked either, but um, I, I want you to, I want you to um, open up your hearts this morning to uh, the title of my message is, I woke up like this, and uh, this is a message that I shared with middle school and high school students a few months ago, and I feel uh, strong to bring it to the church as a, an important reminder to all of us. But nobody looks perfect when they wake up, right? Husbands, this is your moment to uh, whisper in your wife's ear that she does look perfect when she wakes up. Um, typically, when we wake up, we go to the mirror, right? And we look uh, at ourselves before we go to school or for work. Um, when we first wake up, at least for me, it's not my greatest look of the day. And so some of you may feel or look like this when you wake up. Right? That's a don't talk to me until there's double digits on the clock day, or don't talk to me until I have my coffee. What about this, that bedhead? How many of you would say, honestly, you have some great bedhead in the morning? Like you wake up, and it's, it's pretty, pretty wonderful. Uh, this last one, I don't know if you can see it or not, but he's got the sleep lines going on on his face. You ever woken up with one of those before, and you got sleep lines all over the place, or your hand is numb or whatever? Uh, when we wake up in the morning, we go check ourselves in the mirror to make sure none of this is going on so that we can fix ourselves. Um, so, so typically, you go into the, you wake up, you roll out of bed, and some of you um, maybe read your Bible or you pray or something, you go and you, you get ready for the day because you want to improve on what you look like in that moment. You're about to go to a meeting, you're about to go to school, you want to look like a normal human being. Um, how many of you ever had a day where it began and someone saw you before you had a chance to look at yourself in the mirror? Anybody ever had a moment like that? You're like, that was not the way I wanted to start out my day. Maybe a knock on the door early in the morning or spending the night at a friend's house and all of a sudden they are seeing you in all your glory. And it's not a fun sight. Uh, 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 One of those days happened to me back in 1996. I was on a missions trip to Atlanta, Georgia. Youth with a Mission, YWAM. I think Mel, you were were on that trip too and a couple other people from church. we were there ministering while the Olympics were taking place, and um, we had been sleeping basically on a gym floor. The gentleman on one side divided by a curtain, and the ladies on the other side, and, and we had air mattresses, if we brought them, you know, that were that thick. That's when you started out at night, but when you woke up in the morning, you know, all the air's gone type of thing. Um, so it was the end of our trip, and uh, my friend and I, Andy, had stayed up you know, visiting and hanging out with each other and with other friends because we're leaving the next day. And so we thought, you know what, let's just 
get as much in as we can. So we stayed up pretty late. But unfortunately, we went to sleep before some of the other people. If you've ever been around, you know, families or, or hanging out with friends, if, you, if you're one of the first people to fall asleep, typically pranks happen to you. And so uh, we're sleeping, we wake up in the morning, and this was an awkward moment for me. Um, I wake up pretty much the same time that my friend Andy does, and we both wake up and we're like staring at each other. We like separate air mattresses next to each other. Ironically, it happened at the same time. For me, it was a really awkward moment. Um, but as my surroundings come to me and I look at my friend Andy, I realize that my, our friends had decorated his face and his arms with marker and with pen. So he had a beard, a mustache, a goatee, and they had written, you know, hi Andy, it's this time in the morning, how are you, Th- with the pen on his arm and he was sleeping. And so I think this is super funny and I'm laughing at him. But what I don't realize is that he's actually laughing at me. And all of a sudden I realize, wait a minute, what's going on with me? And I look, you know, and all of a sudden it comes to me, I look at my arms, I have the same thing happening. I was decorated with pen and marker all over my face. And so he and I, we rush to the restroom as quickly as possible. And we take that hand soap, you know, just that jelly, that gooey stuff. And, and it wasn't the nice foamy stuff anymore. And we scrubbed and we scrubbed and we scrubbed. And most of it came off, but we come out of the bathrooms like with just these red faces, like it was raw type of thing. That was one of those days for me that my day started Uh, with someone seeing me before I got to see the mirror. Uh, But the reason that we have mirrors is to help us, right? It's not to embarrass us, but it's actually to say, hey, this is what you look like. You need to go fix it. We want to improve on what we look like when we first roll out of bed. So can you imagine standing in front of the mirror this morning, seeing how you looked when you first got out of bed, shrugging your shoulders and say, eh, no big deal. I'll be fine. And then you come to church. Some of you would be embarrassed, right? We would be embarrassed for some of you to come here like that. But, but when we see something that needs to be fixed, we fix it, right? That's why we have mirrors. And there's a lot of comparisons made in the Bible to help us understand the importance of God's word in our life. The Bible is compared to a light. The Bible is compared to fire, to bread, to a sword, And in the book of James, in James chapter 1, it's compared to a mirror. And if you would, turn with me in your Bibles, and we'll get there in just a moment. As we get older, a lot of us may try to avoid mirrors, but we cannot avoid God's word as a mirror. No matter what age we are, we cannot avoid it. So the book of James chapter 1 is where we're going to be in just a moment. James, he's writing to the people of Israel. They had been scattered after Jesus um, had been ascended and uh, into heaven. And so they've kind of been scattered a little bit. So James is writing this letter to them to encourage them, to help them out. James is a very practical book. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, just kind of tells it like it is. So James is writing to address a few problems that these people are facing personally and as a church. Um, overall, these problems stem from kind of one thing, is that they were spiritually immature. So he's writing to people that had not grown up spiritually. They kind of had been maintaining where they were, and, and he's writing to them on some, some specific things. And so James chapter 1, starting in verse 22 says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed and what he does. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for your word. I pray that it would speak to our hearts, God. Your word is speaking, so I pray that our hearts would be open to receive it. And we thank you. In your powerful name we pray. And everyone said, amen. So these, these Christians, these people that James is writing to, they f- have fallen into the same trap that a lot of us have fallen into. Um, and, and James says, not only are, are you wrong and we're wrong, but we're deceiving ourselves. Um, he says, basically, it's not enough to just hear the word. We have to be a doer. We can't just hear it. We have to do it. Um, a lot of us, we will highlight and mark our Bibles. And, and we take a lot of notes. Maybe we're scribbling different things on here. But ask yourself this. Does my bo- Bible mark me? Am I being marked by my Bible? Or am I just marking it up and just taking a lot of notes? It's one thing to read it, but it's another thing to do it. 
uh, some people have this mistaken idea that hearing a good sermon or going to Bible study or going to Sunday school is what makes them grow and get God's blessing. But if we think we're spiritual just for being here this morning, if we think we're spiritual just because we're hearing uh, some scriptures read, we're deceiving ourselves. And so like most of us have come to understand the uncomfortable part about having a mirror is you see yourself for who you really are. And sometimes the uncomfortable part about reading God's word is it tells us um, who we really are. And, it, and it's not always fun. Um, it, it's easier sometimes just to read the easy Bible verses that God loves me, he has a plan for me to prosper, not to harm me, all that kind of stuff. But we tend to kind of veer away from the verses that say, you know, don't do this and don't do that type of thing. And so uh, the, James is being very specific on a few things. So he mentions, James mentions a few mistakes that people make as they look into God's mirror. And the first mistake, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, is the glance. We glance at God's word. In verse 23, um, he, he, he says anybody who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And then in verse 24, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets. Verse 25, he references how we need to look intently. So if we glance at God's word. How many of you remember the show Happy Days? Yeah, I grew up watching that. That was a little before my time. I remember when my parents, you would sometimes have it on or whatever, and now it's on, you know, um, the old rerun type of shows. But there's this character in there named the Fawns. Remember him? And uh, he had everything going on. He was perfect. And uh, there's plenty of times that he would walk past the mirror. He might take out his comb and comb back his hair a little bit. And then what would he say? Hey, like, I'm good. Like, nothing wrong here type of thing. And there's sometimes he wouldn't even have to touch his hair. He was just, I'm good. Um, he was perfect. Unfortunately, that's how we read and approach God's word. We look at it and say, yeah, I'm good. I don't need to work on anything. I'm fine. And we take a look and we assume that everything is well. Uh, a lot of us, okay, and here, please hear my heart on this. Um, when I say, say things like this, this is out of a heart to restore and to encourage and challenge us not to be condemning whatsoever. But we sincerely can read our Bible each day. Uh, but we do it out of religious activity. We do it out of just because I'm supposed to read my Bible. That's what I'm supposed to do. But we're not really profiting from it. We're not really like um, and taking it in into our spirit, into our being. We're just reading it like a, any other book that we would read. Our conscience will bother us. And I've been at this spot before. And this is something that I still have to work on in myself. Our, my conscience sometimes has bothered me because I don't read my chapter a day. Or I don't get my time in with the Lord each day. When in reality, I should be bothered that this isn't changing me. It's kind of like the difference between a photo and an x-ray. You look at the photo on the outside, everything looks good, but the x-ray reveals something much more. Um, some of you have maybe lived this situation. Um, a son or a daughter comes to their parents and says, Mom, I fell, I hurt my arm, I hurt my leg. Um, and the parent looks at it and says, eh, you're fine, right? You don't see any blood, tough it out, you'll be fine. You're just trying to build character in your son or your daughter. But a few days pass and the arm still hurts. Have you ever been in this moment before? And all of a sudden you're like, all right, let's take you to the doctor. And sure enough, the x-ray reveals a broken bone, right? Um, so here's my theory on that. Those kids that were tormented and had to wait that long, when their parents and their kid gets a little scratch, they're going straight to the ER every time, right? Because they're like, oh, it might be a broken bone. My parents one time made me wait a week before I got an x-ray. <laughs> Just teasing. But... But how can we expect to heal? How can we expect to grow? How can we expect to be free if all we do is glance at God's word? We won't see the deeper need in our hearts. So I want to illustrate this point for a moment. If I could have uh, Pastor Zach, uh, not you, I'm changing it up, Pastor Zach and Pastor Jeff. If you guys would come forward, um, little father-son competition here. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to, in just a moment, not yet, we're going to put a picture up. And these guys are very observant, detailed people. Now you know. But Pastor Jeff did this in the first service, but I've changed pictures on you. So you can't use the same answers. So um, what's probably going to work better is if you guys like look at these screens, you get a closer up shot. So there's... No, that is not the answer. I'm sorry. Um, but so what's going to happen is, is we're going to put up a picture and... 
they're going to observe it, and then I have three questions for them afterwards. And so before you show the picture, let's just take a quick poll. How many of you um, are voting for Pastor Jack to win this little competition? Woo! That's sad. How many, of you vo- how many of you voting for Pastor Jeff? <laughs> Would it help you if you had, like, someone up here with you helping you? Oh, he's, okay. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Yeah, uh, let's just do five seconds, okay? So the picture will be up there in five seconds. Are you guys ready? Go for it. All right. Since Chick-fil-A is the currency of heaven, that's why we showed that picture today, so. <laughs> all right, so he, I'm going down here so you all can't cheat. Um, three questions. I'll keep it very simple. How many strawberries? Oh, no, no, oh, oh, no, no they, got, they got to write their answers first. Take it down, take it down. Okay, good job. That was easy, okay. Um, we'll, show the, we'll show the picture in just a moment so we can reveal the answers. Uh, what kind of dipping sauce was it? I think losers should have to buy Chick-fil-A for the winner on this one. You ready for the third and final question? What was the quote on the box of the chicken nuggets? There's a quote on the side. You cannot ask Dave. <laughs> There's a quote on the side of the box of the chicken nuggets. You done? All right, so put up that picture. How many strawberries? Two. That was a good guess. How many did you say, Pastor Jeff? Four. Okay. Uh, what kind of dipping sauce? What kind of dipping sauce? Ranch, Chick, Chick-fil-A sauce. It's honey mustard. All right. So here we go. Last question. What's the quote on the box, the side of the box? Christian chicken. <laughs> It's not Christian chicken. Let's get a guess though. <laughs> Pastor Jeff, there is a quote there. Do you all see it? Sit. Dave, do you know what this is? Yeah. The quote is, we didn't invent the chicken, just the chicken sandwich. Pastor Zach, you win one for three. That's pretty good. Give him a big round of applause. So, just a fun little way to illustrate this point that if we just glance at God's word, how are you going to re- retain it, right? How are you going to be able to take it in? And so that kind of leads into the second mistake. Because we glance, we forget. The second mistake that we make is that we forget. James references that in those verses that we just read. But a lot of us have been saved from embarrassment by looking into a mirror. And we're thankful for it. When we look into the mirror of God's word, we realize that we need special attention in certain areas. But then how crazy is it to think that we walk away and we forget it. We read God's word, it says don't do this or you need to do this or whatever it may be. And then all of a sudden we walk away and we're like, eh, I just glanced at it, I forget it. It seems crazy, but the reality is, is that it happens and it happens to me. Most likely it happens to you. So here's my question. Why do we treat God's word lightly and with lesser meaning than a physical mirror? Why do we treat God's word lightly or with lesser meaning than a physical mirror? How have you ever been, how how have you ever reacted when you truly look into God's word, when we see the true state of our hearts? John Wesley, in in one of the commentaries I was reading, he spoke of in a preaching service where several people, as he was preaching, fell over dead like. They didn't die, but they were dead like in the presence of God by hearing the, the, the word of God. How would you react? Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter six, he saw the Lord in a vision. He cried out, woe is me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. In Luke chapter five, Simon Peter, he's been fishing all night. A lot of you know this story, and he caught nothing. And then Jesus comes upon him and says, go out, cast your nets into the deep. Long story short, they bring in two boats filled with fish. And Peter replies to Jesus, "Um, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He saw the state of his heart. Job, the most righteous man on earth of his day, he confessed to God, I despise myself and I repent. 
So the first mistake is we glance. The second mistake is, is that we forget. And because we're glancing, because we're forgetting, typically we're failing to obey. That, it's kind of just in succession. Hearing is not the same as doing, right? Hearing is not the same as doing. Um, students, your parents ask you to take the dog out to use the restroom. They ask you to set the table, to pick up the clothes in your room, and you hear them, but you don't do it. It's not the same, is it? I guarantee your mama ain't happy if that happens. Or for us who, who uh, are in the workforce, your, jo- your, your boss gives you a task, a project to complete it by, or you need to sell these certain things by a certain time, and, and that, that deadline comes and goes, and you haven't done it, or you haven't completed the task. Your employer, your boss is probably not very happy and not pleased with what it is. Hearing is not the same as doing. Reading our Bible is not the same as doing what it says, is it? We can read it all we want, but until we do it, it's different. Talking about the Bible is not the same as actually doing what it says. We're talking about it right now, but when we leave this place, are we living out what the Bible says? We can come to church all we want. We can go to students, all the camps that you want. You can go to retreats for a men's retreat, a women's retreat, whatever it may be, missions trips, all the galore that you want. But if we're not living out what the word of God says, we're being religious and we're being lukewarm. And the Bible says that God spits out lukewarm. So please hear me out. I'm not saying perfection here. This is not saying you'll never fail again because we all, we're all human and we know that's impossible to be perfect. But this is a, a life that is characterized by obedience. That's really what it's about. It's a life that's characterized by obedience. And that's what God's word is saying. That's what James is trying to get to. So if we're gonna use God's word properly and to our benefit, then we need to gaze into it very carefully and very seriously. And so there's three things that I wanna quickly say. There's three things that it's gonna take to live our lives according to God's word. The first thing it's gonna take is time. It's gonna take time. Our lives can be busy, right? They can be hectic. They can, we can be frantic in our activity. Um, Seems like some of us may not have enough time to sleep, eat, or eat or pray many days, right? Anybody had moments like that? It's like, man, I'm so busy. I don't even have time to think. I'm so busy. But if we're going to grow into spiritually mature Christians, we need to take time for God's word. Now, just on a side thing, for me personally, um, I can't retain a ton of information um, all at once by reading. That's not my way of retaining it. So for my, my portion of, of studying and reading might just be a smaller section than what my wife does because she can read a lot and she retains it all. Uh, there's nothing right or wrong about either one of them, but I'm just saying I don't want people to feel guilty because they, they don't remember a lot when they read it. I'm in the same boat, and so I have to shorten up the, the areas that I'm reading, and I go over it several times. Anybody else like that? Um, some of you who can retain a lot, I'm jealous because I wish I could read and retain more. Um, but it is going to take time. Um, if, if this is the mirror of our lives and we take time physically to look into a mirror, uh, we need to take time spiritually to look into God's word. So is this an area that you can improve on, taking time? The second one is going to take is attention. With our busy and hectic lives comes the role of multitasking. We feel like we, can, we have to have several things happening all at once to be productive when a lot of studies show that it's actually counterproductive the more things we have going on at once. God's word is of utmost importance, guys. It demands our attention. So here's, here's as practical as it can be. Put down your phone when, you, when you're reading God's word. In fact, some of you may say, well, I have the Bible on my phone, and I do too, but man, I get distracted by the many other things I can do on my phone, right? Uh, I'll get a text message through, or I need to change the song that I'm listening to, or or an email pops up, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's best just to put that down and walk away. Um, Wake up a little earlier before everybody else does in your house. Stay up a little bit later at night before you go to sleep. It's going to take our attention. Go to a quiet place, whatever it may be. Is this an area that you can improve on, your attention? The third thing it's going to take is devotion. It's going to take devotion. Joshua 1.8 says this, Do not let this book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then 
you will be prosperous and successful. Joshua, he's the new leader of Israel. Moses has just died, and the Lord is meeting with Joshua, and this is what the Lord says to him. He says, don't let this book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Notice he doesn't say weekend by weekend or just on Sundays, meditate on it. No, he says day and night. And then he says, when you do that, you will be prosperous and successful. The Lord knew that Joshua would draw his strength and counsel from God's word. Psalm 1 verse 2 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Speaking of devotion, we tend to be devoted to things that are close to our hearts, the things that we like, the things that you know, are, are, we're more drawn to, so we're more devoted to those kinds of things. And so here's my question to all of us is that if Jesus has our heart, then why, aren't we de- why can't we be devoted to him and his word? right? Let Jesus have your heart, but then be devoted to him and his word. We also tend to be devoted to um, things based on how we've we've been raised or how we've, it's been modeled for us. And so a few weeks ago, Pastor Austin spoke, and one of the parts that he kind of challenged us with as as parents and grandparents and even role models is that if, if we want our sons and our daughters, our grandkids, or the students that we're discipling to Uh, put an importance on God's word, then they have to see it in in us. They have to see it in you. Children's leaders in this room, youth leaders and college leaders in this room, set the bar super high, not out of your uh, pride, but out of setting an example for other students to follow. Lead the way. One great aspect of a doctor or a physician is that they will tell the truth. When you don't know physically what's going on, you go to them and they'll take an x-ray or they'll do an MRI or they'll just kind of break it down. This is what's happening to you and to your body. And even though we won't understand it, they help it to be understood. And so God's word is going to tell the truth. It is the truth. It is the absolute truth. So beyond whatever it everybody in society is saying about anything, about life or cultural issues or whatever it may be, if you return to God's word as the plumb line of your life, it's going to guide you and it's going to navigate you. So I have to wonder if, that, if that's the reason why we avoid God's word. Maybe this is why we just glance at it, because we know what's in here. And we know what we're supposed to do, but we're too comfortable. Or maybe we don't want to see ourselves for how we really are. We're comfortable, we don't want to sacrifice We want just enough of Jesus to feel good, but we don't want too much that we have to sacrifice, that we have to make a change. I was reading in a devotion book yesterday um, something that I want to share with you. It says, the American gospel has evolved into a gospel of addition without subtraction. It is the belief that we can add Christ to our lives, but not subtract sin. It is a change in belief without a change in behavior. It is a spiritual experience without any cultural impact. It is revival without reformation, without repentance. We know it says to forgive. We know it says to tithe. We know it says to not have a hint of sexual immorality. We know it says to honor your parents, but the difficulty lies in doing, in the obedience. We just want to add Jesus, but not have to subtract away any sin in our lives. But can I tell you that it's wonderful when you live according to God's word. And we're not perfect, and I'm not perfect by far. That's, I think, that one reason why I've struggled through this message is because I realize, man, this mirror is right in front of my face. And I'm sharing it with you guys, and I know I'm not perfect. But would you look at verse 25 for a moment with me? This is what James says, the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. And he continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. James, I love it. The emphasis is on the practice and the doing. This is the perfect law of freedom. When we obey, we're free. When we obey, we're free. John 8, 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. When we obey his word, we grow in spiritual knowledge and as we grow in spiritual knowledge, we grow in freedom from our sin. Psalm 119, verse 45 says, I will walk about in freedom because I have sought out your precepts. The blessing, James says, comes from the doing, not solely in just the reading. 
not forgetting but obeying. This is not out of legalism, this is out of love. You and I, we can live a blessed life by intently looking into God's word. Not gazing at it, but intently remembering and obeying. James is reminding us here, and as we close, worship team, if you would come. James is reminding us that what is heard and spoken about on Sunday has to be lived out on Monday. God's word must be a part of our nature, of our being, of us. Would you stand with me this morning? In John 14, 6, there's a lot of verses that we could use to kind of close out this. And I I, I sense maybe this is a, a very basic, very simple verse for some people here today, but this is what's happened. Jesus is comforting his disciples. He's saying, I'm about to leave, um, and I'm going to go prepare a place, and you'll be able to come with me. And, and the disciples say, we don't know. Thomas says, we don't, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? And Jesus, in John 14, 6, says this, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Very plain and simple. The Bible says that the way to heaven is through Jesus. So today, if you have not placed your faith and your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do so. If you woke up this morning and when you examined yourself and you realized that change was needed, you'd be a fool not to. We'd all be a fool not to make any changes. And um, God's word is our mirror. But if we're not looking intently at it, how do we know what needs to be changed? How do we know what the truth is? How can we be set free from sin if we don't know what the truth is? We know the truth by reading God's word. When we read it and we're we're forgiven, we're restored, we're transformed. Today is not a day of uh, condemnation, of condemning anybody here, but today is a day of, of a challenge, of a reminder to us that, listen, this is God, this is the word of God, this is the absolute truth, and this is the mirror to help us out in life. And so we're gonna sing in just a moment, but the real altar moment happens when you leave this place. That's when really the rubber hits the road. That's when the doing happens. You've heard it, now let's go do it. Let's take time every day to be in God's word. So how many of you would say, just by a show of hands, that not only can you improve, maybe in spending more time and reading God's word, but actually living it out? around. Not, there's lots of, lots of hands. And this isn't to say, well, we've got a big response. This is just saying, listen, I'm human. I need this. I need this personally for me. And so as we sing this song, the, the bridge and the chorus are, are wonderful. It's reminding us of God's faithfulness. It's reminding us that his word will last. If he says it's going to happen or that needs to happen, then it's, it will. Uh, he's a faithful God. I was thinking in the first service, um, when, when Abraham was making a sacrifice and God provided um, a ram and God was faithful then, the great thing is it's the same God today. He hasn't changed. He's a wonderful God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same God that Abraham was worshiping is the same God that's here this morning that you can worship and that you can draw near to. So as we sing this song, let's make this our prayer. God, thank you for being faithful through your word. And I know that your word is true and it's powerful. Jesus, today... We thank you for your written word. And I pray, God, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to live out what you've commanded us, to live out your word and your powerful word, God. We sing this, God, as of a declaration to you. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Let's sing. Jesus.